Hello Guilty Feminist, this culture episode is quite unusual for us in all sorts of ways, but I think really, really important. Francesca Martinez, friend of the show, brilliant stand-up comic, incredible feminist playwright, got in touch with me to say that her brother, Raul Martinez, uh, who's an extraordinary artist and documentary maker and all sorts of things, had made this incredible documentary and I should watch it. Um, Now, it's a multi-part documentary and it's called In the Eye of the Storm. And it's uh, with someone you probably have heard speaking, Yanis Varoufakis, who was the Greek Minister for Finance. Um, And he is an economist and he talks, uh, he, he basically talks about late stage capitalism in this documentary. It's partly about his life, but then partly about his extraordinary economic Uh, experience and model for looking at the world. And I was really blown away by the documentary and I thought I should talk to Raul and Yanis because they've got a lot to say about where we are in the world and what's happening with inequality, what's happening with capitalism and how we as feminists might begin to tackle it. I hope you enjoy it. It's an unusual conversation for me to have, but one that was so fascinating to me. I can't stop thinking about it and I can't stop thinking about what to do about it. So please give it a listen, see what you think and ideally um, share it with some friends and talk about it because I think it's the beginning of a really important conversation. I should also say that this was going to be recorded in front of a large live audience at the Royal Society of Arts. And I'm very sorry if you bought a ticket for it and couldn't come. Ironically, we couldn't have it there because the Royal Society of Arts is currently in a dispute uh, with their workers about pay, which they need to resolve um, before we could do this episode there. Yanis Raul and I put out a statement to say that we, of course, support the workers and want them to be paid properly. And so on that basis, we could not go ahead. Um, We ended up doing it in a small room with a small audience at Brian Eno's studio, Um, He very kindly lent that to us because he was having an event there and he also did the music for the documentary. Um, So bless you, Brian, you know, for having us at short notice. It was a small but perfectly formed and very enthusiastic audience. And if you did have tickets, I'm glad we can share it for you in podcast form. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah, and welcome to this very special Culture Club edition of The Guilty Feminist. We're at a studio in London with a small but mighty audience. (laughs) And we've just watched an episode of an amazing new documentary series in the eye of the storm, The Political Odyssey of Yanis Varoufakis. How good was the pronunciation of that name then? Was that good? Now you've said it. Spot on. How was it? Spot on. No need to be guilty. Not Excellent. about that. <laughs> Excellent. So this is now just the feminist. Okay. Yanis uh, Varoufakis is the former finance minister of Greece who's been engaged in a dramatic struggle to rescue the most bankrupt nation in Europe. He's with me now. Hello, Yanis. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on The Guilty Feminist today. The pleasure is all mine. It really is, because we hardly ever have men. Um, so it's, you you're one of two. a very select few. You're very one of a very select few number to, for, to be a man allowed onto the Guilty Feminist. Um, but I'm also joined by the director of the series, Raúl Martinez, who is an artist, philosopher, and author of the book Creating Freedom, as well as a documentary maker. Hello, Raúl. Hey, great to be here. It's, it's an honour. It's an unqualified delight to have you. And some of the guilty feminists might be saying, men on the show, this is rare. And usually it's going to be a really good reason. They've got to have cleared a very high bar. But you have, in creating this extraordinary documentary together, uh, Yanis being the subject of the documentary, you being the documentary maker. Um, And it really is about the extraordinary situation that capitalism has contorted itself into and how you ended up as it were, in the eye of the storm, but we are also now all in the eye of the storm. So I'd like to ask you first, can you tell us, just a sort of elevator pitch 
And I understand that the elevator might have to go to quite a high floor for you to answer this. Um, Yanis, what would you say this series is about in your, from your point of view? And Raul, I'm going to ask you the same question. And from seeing you discuss things this afternoon, I know that you don't always agree, which I love. I love because you have very good natured uh, debates. So I'm, I'm open and on for you to, to, to disagree here as much as you like. Yanis, how, how would you describe in the eye of the storm the political odyssey of you? Epigrammatically, it's my take on what gives to very few people mm. the power to make the majority do things on their behalf. You see, Lenin, Lenin had a, a great expression that mm. politics is all about who does what to whom. Mm. So th that has been a fascinating question for me. You know, why do some people, usually men, have all this power to compel others to do things on their behalf and sometimes to do it voluntarily and with their full consent. That has always been a question that's been exercising me. And especially after our generation experienced its 1929 moment in 2008 with the collapse of Wall Street, the city of London and so on, which changed the world and um, you know, sacrificed the whole generation unnecessarily on a bonfire of debt-driven austerity. You know, why Why do we tolerate them? It's How do true. they get the power? Why don't we just rise up and go, no, you're yeah, out? But you know, that is the question. We, that is the question. So the, the, for me, that is what this uh, documentary series is all about. How do they get us to keep going along with it? So yeah. we keep working crazy hours for little money or living in a disenfranchised area where there's no purpose and no work at all. How do we keep on accepting the fact that they take all the money and the power and we just have to be... Bevan had cops. put it beautifully in the 1950s by saying that... Um, the whole question, the, the main question, uh, is uh, how does wealth persuade poverty to use its political freedom in order to keep wealth in power? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the, mo the most beautiful way of putting it. So that, that has been the question always in my mind. And that's an this documentary is an exploration of that. It's, it's my take on how the events from you know, the beginning of capitalism accentuated by the great capitalist collapses of 1929 and our generation's 2008, uh, how it fashioned that kind of power and how this power reproduces itself. Ralph, from your point of view, what led you to Yanis as, a, as a, an interesting subject for a documentary and what is this documentary about from your point of view? Um, well, I'm going to disagree with everything you said now. I'm <laughs> No, I'd known for quite a few years I wanted to make a documentary on capitalism and economics. Uh, the language of economics is weaponized routinely to justify the unjustifiable and to take all the important decisions in society and say, OK, you can have democracy, you can vote between these parties, but these are technocratic decisions. Mm -hmm. We need a class of experts to make these. And, you know, the, the truth could, couldn't be further from that. And particularly after the 2010s with austerity, where there was such a kind of a propaganda blitz to convince the public that they needed to bear the brunt. The bankers caused a crisis, but it was the public, it was the poor, it was the workers that had to bear the brunt of what came after. I just saw there was, there, there was an urgency um, to increase the economic literacy in society, and I wanted to see what I could do. Um, so, so I had this agenda, and I, I, I'd been aware of Yanis for many years, I, I'd read his books. Um, I read The Global Minotaur, which is fantastic. And what I was struck by with that initially was his analysis of why the crash happened and why austerity was taking place went deeper than anything I'd come across mm. up to that point. So I was very impressed with that. I thought, okay, here's someone who really understands the deeper dynamics of what's happening and the whole you know, history of the 20th century and how it led up to this point. But there was something else that I was, I was following the whole time, which was, of course, what happened with Syriza in Greece. The key moment, you know, after crisis, you get opportunity. And in that opportunity, in that moment, in that like, small window, you have a rare chance to change things in society which norm normally are impossible to change, or very, very difficult, let's say. And it was remarkable what happened in Greece, that like, out of nowhere, this radical coalition actually took power, formed a government, um, 
And, you know, this has not happened in my lifetime in this country. It hadn't happened in most European nations. And so I think the lefties across the world, progressives across the world, were watching to see what would happen. Now, it wasn't a happy ending, but it seemed to me that it's a really important story to tell, that if we let the winners, you know, tell the story of history and what happens, then we are going to fail to learn the lessons that we need to learn so that next time around, at the next crisis, we can do better. We can actually exploit them. Um, and I was, you know, the more I learned about this story, the more I read of, of Yanis's work, the more deeply impressed I became with him as a communicator, as, as a thinker, but particularly when it came down to it, as his role, you know, as finance minister in Greece, negotiating with the Troika, he did something that we really see very rarely. He chose the right path, the hard path, and he said no. He said no to the Troika, the only finance minister in Europe that's done this. And I like to quote Tony Benn here because he had a great line. He just said, look, the most powerful word in politics is the word no. But actually, when there's immense pressure from, you know, the, the biggest institutions of capitalism on the planet saying, you're not going to say no, you're going to do what we tell you. Mm. Simply the symbolic value of being able to hold your ground and say, you know, make all the threats you want. The answer is no, and we're going to find a way through. Yanis was able to do that, and I will forever have such deep respect for him for doing that. I think it's one of the reasons that he remains a key figurehead of progressives, you know, not just in Greece, but globally. Um, and I think had Syriza had the same convictions, then maybe history would look a bit different today. Mm. How is it that human beings seem so corruptible? When, when human beings get a bit of power or get access to wealth, it feels like one of the themes of your documentary is that they're so corruptible and they then themselves take away uh, the rules and the checks and balances that would stop that corruption because they're in charge of it. And that is an eternal conundrum. And you seem like somebody who is not corruptible in that way. What are your thoughts on that, Yanis? Why are human beings so corruptible? And is there any way of stopping this uh, constant corruption that we now see in our governing parties across the world? The long and the short answer is that it really matters that you don't like political power as a politician, mm -hmm. that you don't want to be a minister. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that for the first time well before I entered electoral politics in academia, in universities, here in Britain and in Australia and in Greece and in the United States where I've worked in universities. I remember that any time a fellow academic, a professor, volunteered to be head of the department. It was a sure sign that we should never, never have him or her do it. Because if you really want to be head of the department, what on earth are you doing in a university? Because the beauty of the university is that you are paid to read, write, teach, think, you know, do nothing while you're reflecting. Now, why do you want to be a manager? If you want to be a manager, go for, work for Goldman Sachs. Now, of course, somebody has to manage the department. So it is a chore. It's like taking the garbage out. Somebody's got to do it. But if you become enamored of the process of taking the garbage out, then you should, you should see a psychoanalyst. Similarly, if you want to be head of the department, to take this further, if you want to be a minister, you should be prohibited from being a minister. So should it be done dangerous. by like jury duty? <laughs> Absolutely. I really believe in that, and um, you know, if it's, this is this is not such an original idea, because uh, as an Athenian, I have the right to say that in ancient Athens, every single office of power was uh, filled through sortition, through the ballot, through, through randomization. Okay, but through, how do you know? Jurist. Because if somebody said to me, "Oh no, you've got to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer because your numbers come up." I mean, sorry, Yanis, but uh, I, you, I, I would be, I could be Minister of the Arts for a, a, yeah. a year. I'd love that. But I would be so bad because I, I can't do basic 
housekeeping. Like I'd be, my spreadsheets would be all over the shop. I, I would need a lot of support by experts to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I fear mm. that I fear my, 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 my time in office would be shorter than, uh, than, God, I was so short I've forgotten her name. <laughs> Liz Truss. Liz Truss. I, all I could think of was Theresa May, and I thought, no, she was around for ages. Um, Liz Truss. And that's how, that's, how, that's how long she was Prime Minister, that I cannot remember her name at a moment's notice. Um, like, how do you, mm. you know, in the Athenian model, yeah. how did that work out? Very well. And you know what? You just qualified for being Chancellor of the Exchequer of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. <laughs> you just qualified. Because by saying that you would be terrified doing it, mm -hmm. you made yourself a better chancellor than Jeremy Hunt is as we speak. Because he's ignorant, he's malignant, but he thinks he's great. Mm. I'd much rather have you fearing the Things job. Going, oh my God, I'll get it wrong. Oh my God, I'm going to check three know, times. Can I, I get I'm some other petitions? I'm going to out, here. right? Yes, um, I see what you mean. Yes. Ar arrogance is... is the is ancient possible. Athenians yeah. were split on this matter. They were two parties the Democrats and the aristocrats. The aristocrats hated the idea of you know, the jury system. Uh, they didn't like the idea of democracy. Mm -hmm. They didn't like the idea of the demos being in control of uh, matters of state. That's why they loved elections. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. the, the Democrats were against elections because the Democrats knew that the aristocracy would always be able to buy elections. Mm -hmm. They would have the better orators, the better advertisers, the better, you know, the Saches and the Saches, the Robert Murdochs, and they would be able to Bill corner public power, opinion. The this is why the Democrats were against elections, which sounds like a contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there were only two offices in ancient Athens that were um, filled by election or appointment. One was a general of the army, because there, you know, you need to know something about fighting. Okay, that made sense. So they chose the, the general of the army through an electoral process. The second was the banker. Th that I, it's a story that I truly adore saying <laughs> or telling. Um, the banker was always a slave. They selected a slave. You know why? Because citizens could not be flogged, but slaves could. Wow. Wow. And I think that's a great idea for today's society. <laughs> I'm gonna just... Bankers should all be enslaved. <laughs> in the views of Yanis, and not necessarily those of the guilty feminist, um, I'm not saying bring in enslavement. Why or, are you against enslaving the bankers? I, I, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm just, just against enslavement and flogging in general. But um, no, no, we wouldn't flog them, but we have the right to flog them. Okay, right. Well, listen, these are all just ideas. Um, I know that you're speaking. We live in a world where they rule everything, and they have power which is proportionate mm -hmm. to their bankruptcy. So the more bankrupt they are, the more power they have over you, and the more power they have to force the political system which they own to uh, bail them out whenever they lose money um, by imposing harsh austerity on the majority, particularly women. So you will excuse my joking about no, slavery, but it's not that much of a joke. <laughs> No, I know what you're saying, that at the moment they have disproportionate power and freedom and, and are not regulated. And the fact that, that those regulations... They own you. Mm. You're, you're understating it. They own you. They own me. They own particularly the delivery workers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women who are working in factories and in shops, they own all of us. They produce nothing. They offer no services which are important to the world, and they have the capacity to buy our politics, to buy our media, to poison the debate, and to make sure that whatever profits are being made in the economy are theirs, and whatever losses they have are ours. You, your new book, Techno-Feudalism, and I know we're talking about the documentary today, but I was really, really fascinated by you know, hearing you talk about that. You were saying that Jeff Bezos is basically going back to a feudalist model mm -hmm. where he takes rent from all of the workers. So it's not, oh, well, I'm selling bicycles and I'm selling them yes. through this platform so much as the rent he charges to, for you to be able to be visible to sell your bicycles anymore is a feudal model. 
Can you just unpack that a little bit? Because it was a new idea to me that I hadn't heard, but it was very convincing. Look, compare and contrast a lord or an earl or a a baron from yesteryear, from the 16th, 17th century. What was the deal there? They were born into the landed gentry. Mm -hmm. They were born with property rights over the land. The land was occupied by peasants. Generation after generation, they would live in the same homes, in the same huts, they would uh, plow the same soil, they would produce. At the end of every harvest, the sheriff would arrive on behalf of the lord or the baron. The sheriff would collect 40, 50, 60 percent of the harvest. The leftovers would be there for the, the peasants. That's rent. That's ground rent. Okay? But it's really a very simple process of extraction. Capitalism changed all that by expelling the peasants from the land through the process that you know very well as the enclosures, and that created the working class who were landless, they had no access to the land, so they had to sell their labor in factories, shops, and so on and so forth. Now, let's go to Bezos, since you kindly mentioned him. Now, he's a capitalist, of course. He's not a landlord in the sense that he was inherited with a silver spoon in his mouth, in his mouth and property rights, no. He invested money given to him by bankers, particularly central bankers, but that's another story, in all this amazing machinery which runs Amazon. It doesn't live in the cloud. I call it cloud capital, but it's really not in the cloud. It's on Earth. It's you know huge server farms that if you go into there, the buzz of those servers sounds like a factory of the 18th century, 19th century. Um, the optic fiber cables crisscrossing the oceans. And you know, it's machinery. So he owns capital. But that capital is really very interesting because it doesn't produce anything except a digital platform. So the moment you enter that digital platform, Amazon.com, you've exited capitalism. It's a fiefdom, a digital fiefdom that has been created out of capital. But the moment you enter Amazon.com, you're not in capitalism. It's not even a market. People mistake Amazon for being a market because there are lots of sellers and lots of buyers. Yes, there are. But... No seller and buyer can talk to one another, can see each other, unless they have been matched by the algorithm owned by Jeff Bezos. And that algorithm does the following things. Firstly, it trains you to train it, to know you, so that it gives you recommendations, which are usually good, so that then, once it has your attention and it has your trust, because it has given you good recommendations in the past, it can peddle stuff for you to, to want to buy, and then you want it, because you become very impressionable as a result of its good recommendations. That's a relationship between you and the machine, the algorithm, that Jeff owns it. The moment you have that desire that it was input into your bosom, into your heart, by the algorithm, Bezos matches you with somebody who provides that, a seller, a producer, a capitalist, who, who creates who produces this bicycle or binoculars, whatever it is, okay, and sells it to you directly, not through some shop, but through his own warehouses, lorry drivers, exploited proletariat, and so on, hmm? and charges the capitalist 40%. You know, when you buy something from Amazon, 40% of what you pay, 10 out of every, sorry, 4 out of every 10 pounds you pay goes to Jeff Bezos. That's a rent. That's equivalent of the extraction of the harvest from the peasant. Additionally, and I think I find this absolutely fascinating, uh, not only is the capitalist selling stuff, electric bicycles or books or whatever, on Amazon.com, a vassal capitalist whose profits mostly are appropriated in the form of cloud rent, the equivalent of ground rent, by the techno feudal lord that we know as Jeff Bezos, but you and I, whenever we are in Amazon.com, simply by looking around, by posting reviews, by making purchases, and so on, we are adding to the cloud capital of Jeff Bezos, who are making his capital more valuable because it has more information that it gets from us. So we are like peasants that are producing Mm -hmm. data and cloud capital for him without being paid for it. That is not capitalism. Welcome to techno-feudalism, as I like to say. I think this is a good moment to say that the series is going to be available on Amazon... (laughs) <laughs> in, in about six weeks but 
If you don't want to give 40% no, I don't. to Jeff Bezos, yeah, how do I get it's a... available right now. Yes. Um, go to eyeofthestorm.info. I-N-F-O. Yes. So do something good and deprive Jeff Bezos of 40%. Of his okay, yeah. So yeah. If, we buy it, yeah. if we buy it directly from you, you yeah. get all the money. We but get 90% of it and Vimeo gets 10 Which seems more reasonable. It's, it's better that it's a better Vimeo deal. is a cloud capitalist oh, no. enterprise as it's well. The best we could do, except Yannis. that, yeah, yeah. You got to, you got to get it. We've got to get They're it. Yeah, less successful than Amazon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and this is a completely independently made documentary, isn't it? So, how did you fund it in the first place? From the start, uh, I put my own money into it. My sister put a bit too, which. Very grateful for. Your sister's a friend of the show. She's been on the show before. Yeah. Her name's Francesca Martinez. Francesca Martinez, comedian, very, writer. Very brilliant. Um, very, uh, very, very brilliant comedian and writer. And she wrote the most extraordinary play that I saw at the National, um, I think, last year, uh, called All of Us, Thank which you. was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I was actually asking your mother how she produced two such brilliantly talented uh, artistic children. And she said... Uh, honestly, no screens and just let them be bored. And uh, so your boring childhood's really paid off there, Raoul, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, the silver lining to boredom, yeah. Yeah, you've all got Nokias, I notice. You, none of you have smartphones. None of us are smartphones. None of you are helping Jeff Bezos get his cloud farm in the sky. No, this is it. We're doing all we can. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> so you put your own money into it. And then how do you get something like this going? Because it's very beautifully done. It's a beautiful, beautiful right. documentary. And I learned so much from watching it. Thank you. Um, well, to get it off the ground, you don't need too much money. So we flew out to Athens. We took a cameraman. We, we were in a dark room, holed up there for about a week. And I would just ask Yanis questions for three, four hours a day, which was just a great privilege. I think I exhausted him by the end of the week, but he was absolutely fantastic. I'd planned to make a 90-minute feature, but the interview, there was so much gold there, mm. I had to expand it into this six-part series. Um, which I should say, I should just clarify, half of it, it's like it's split into two parts. So half of it, half of it covers Yanis's time as finance minister, which is this kind of epic journey. It's inherently dramatic um, and unfolds like a thriller. The second half it sort of really expands into analysis of global capitalism, where we are today, the rise of the far right, austerity, the ecological challenge. And it really tries to tie those threads together into a way, into a narrative that hopefully can help people make sense of the world today, which, you know, there's quite a bit of urgency uh, yes, in, in doing that. It Honestly, it felt like it pulled back a Band-Aid or a plaster and I saw a gaping wound that I suspected was there, but I understood it more uh, seeing it. And so some of that isn't, it's not horrifying to watch. It's not like, oh God, I can't look at the screen. But it did spiral me into, a, I suppose, a place where I, I think my overriding question that I wanted to mm. ask you as an interviewer was, Yanis, are we fucked? Like, is there anything that can be done? Like, it, it feels a little bit like, oh Jesus, it's all running at this absolute like a runaway train it's you know because of the speed of technology because of the corruption of those at the top because those at the top have taken away the regulations so they can have more money and more power and more money and more power and one of the things that you point out um there are no borders for money capital can just cross any border no passport if you want to send money anywhere in the world oh just open open borders paypal away big shifting big money from one but but human beings cannot mm -hmm. cross borders we have invented borders to stop human beings moving without regulation but we but money is just money and commodities yeah. money and commodities are free that's what liberalism is Mm -hmm. Freedom for capital and freedom for commodities and slavery for human beings. Including, and this is my humanist, you know, if you want extravagant, extravagant claim, which I have stolen from Marx, including capitalists. Because, you know, Marx has this amazing half page somewhere buried in Das Kapital in which he laments the fate of the capitalist which at first, when I read it as a 17-year-old, I was amazed. But, but he's being sympathetic to the capitalists, to the enemy. And yet he was, because as a humanist, he said, look, I feel for the capitalist. He goes to bed. It's a he always, right? Mm -hmm. Especially back then. Um, he goes to bed at night, having nightmares, 
that he's going to go bankrupt and become like the workers that he exploits. So he, even if he's a good man, he can't be allowed to be a good man because if he stops exploiting his workers, he will be just like them. He won't save them. He will be a sad bastard like them. In other words, we've developed these amazing technologies, meaning the steam engine, but now we can talk about industrial robots, all right, or cloud capital. We've invented these amazing machines that should be our slaves. But we, as humans, whether we are proletarians or shopkeepers or indeed capitalists, we end up laboring every day, every day, hmm? exploiting each other, losing our humanity to serve the machines. It's a bit like the Matrix, if you want. So, you know, so you're right, but allow me to say that because the, the gist of your initial question, are we fucked? Mm -hmm. Is this the end? That essentially invites me to predict. Mm -hmm. And here I have an ethical position, a political position, a philosophical position, that we don't have the right to predict. If we're meteorologists, our job is to predict the weather. That's what the job is, right? But we can... You know, sleep easy at night that we're doing it because the weather doesn't give a damn about our predictions. So if you're a meteorologist, you are waiting for the, working for the Met yeah. and you predict that tomorrow it's going to be an almighty storm here in London. If you're wrong, it doesn't matter because nature is going to do whatever nature is going to do. The weather doesn't give a damn about your meteorological model. But when it comes to society, our predictions influence what we do. Mm -hmm. And therefore, our predictions are absolutely enmeshed with the outcome. Mm -hmm. So if I sit here with you and Raul and say, yes, we are fucked, I'm contributing to us being fucked. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have the right, the ethical authority, to predict. So let's not predict. Because you create the let's run, just do run, run what on is the right. banks by saying, as soon as you say the bank's going to go under, you create a run on the bank and then the bank goes yeah, under. Yeah, but I, I don't care about banks going absolutely. under. I want them to be flogged. You know, remember that? <laughs> That's right. No, no. I just mean as an example. But as if, an I predict, yeah. if I predict, let's say that people take seriously what I say, which is not strictly speaking true. Uh, let's say that everybody that is listening to us is going to tell everybody that Jan said that and everybody is very impressed by what Jan says and I say we're fucked and you know the climate catastrophe is given and uh, we'll never be able to liberate ourselves from capital and from machinery and all that then everybody was going to get depressed and do nothing about it and then my prediction is going to be confirmed just because I made it mm -hmm. so that's why I'm saying that we have a duty to do that which we think is right mm -hmm. for the hell of it Yes, my bank's uh, illustration was a was a metaphor, but it works in the same way. Yes, that the does. more it we does. think we don't have any hope, the more we will act as if mm -hmm. hopelessness is inevitable. Self fulfilling. So, thoughts. so we have to. We absolutely have to act as if uh, real change is possible. And it, it is possible. You see, I mean, David Graeber, the late David Graeber, had a fantastic line. He said, "Everything could be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, yeah, everything could be different. We made what we have." Yeah. We could have made it differently, and we could make it different tomorrow. Now, how likely is it? Don't ask, ask this question. It's as likely as we make it. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it it's not science. It's society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The episode that we watched this afternoon uh, was called An Evil Dance Between Partners. Could you speak to who the partners are and why it is an evil dance? Raoul, do you want to take that? I will take that, but before I do, I'm just going to finish answering your earlier question. So I made it sound like I put some money in, my sister put it in, and we were all good. No, that only got us about 10% of the way or whatever financially, but it got us to the point of being able to pretty much cut together most of the series. And then I was lucky enough to meet two of the people in the audience tonight, and um, they are producers who were incredibly generous and supportive, and they saw what we cut, and they made it possible to finish. They're the reason that it, you know the series is not languishing on my hard drive in my flat, um, so I'd want to just say thank you to Salwa and to Weil who are here. Without them, that's great. And if everyone could, who can afford to buy it, could buy it, um, you will learn so much. It's really, really worth buying. And it's, it's, uh, it, you'll, you'll learn so much. And you, it, it's always wonderful to watch a documentary because you feel like you've read about six books. 
but you also I remember so much more because I've seen a face and you know you can put it on while you're cooking supper or something like that and it's watchable again you can listen to it like a podcast so I think it's it's really worth the money how much is it going to be 15.99 15.99 but you get six episodes you do get six episodes yeah um, it's, it's, and well, you, it's okay deal good deal I'd say yeah well you if, if you can afford it please do and then have mate you can have a watch party and have your family watch it with you it's, you know, when you think about all the subscription services people sign up to and how much books are and that kind of thing, it's really watchable again as well. You, you'll watch it a few times and you'll really, you'll really remember a lot from it. And it is hopeful and it is very, very inspiring, but it does teach you a lot of things that you, I feel like I should have already known, but didn't. Well, thanks for that. And I'd like to say to all your listeners, you know, we haven't abducted you. You said that with your own free will. There's not, there, there's not, there's not a gun to your head. Um, yeah, I will be allowed out in half an hour. Yeah. Told me. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if, I, if I keep on like keep this. reading the script, and it should be <laughs> fine. Um, but let's return to the other question. Hello, guilty feminists. Just interrupting this episode briefly to say that we have a new Guilty Feminist book club with Waterstone. So it's the Guilty Feminist and Waterstone's book club. The very first one will be at Waterstone's London Piccadilly on Wednesday, the 27th of March at 6.30 p.m. Now, the very first book we're going to discuss is Prima Facie. And some of you will know this as an extraordinary play uh, that only had one person in it, uh, and that character was played by Jodie Comer, and it was a legal drama, and it was written by a playwright, an Australian playwright called Susie Miller, who used to be a lawyer, and it's the it's a feminist tour de force. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, they both won Olivier's for it. Jodie Comer won a Tony for it. It was absolutely a triumph. Not everyone got to see it because you couldn't get a ticket. Some people will have seen it on National Theatre at home because it was recorded, but Susie wanted to do it as a novel anyway. Um, originally, so now she has written Prima Facie as a novel, which everybody can read. Um, but we don't want the Guilty Feminist Book Club to just be a uh, puff piece. We want to make sure we're contrasting, comparing and contrasting books and uh, thinking about how books are written then as compared to how books have been written in the past. So we thought we'd pair each new book with a feminist classic. And the one we've chosen this time is Fear of Flying by Erica Jong. Fear of Flying is a 1973 feminist classic. I haven't read it for years, uh, not certainly not since I've been doing The Guilty Feminist, so I'm really fascinated uh, to see how it reads today and uh, look at the different styles of the novels and that kind of thing. Um, Jessica Foster Q is also joining us for the book club and there will be one other who will be announced soon. You can get tickets if you go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows, you can get the ticket along with one of the books, either Prima Facie or Fear of Flying, but the book won't be available till the night. Um, or you can just buy the books yourself and read them ahead of time. We will be talking about the books, so the show will contain spoilers if you haven't read the books yet. So we hope to see as many of you there as possible, and we'll also be recording it as a live episode. And also, just a reminder... I am performing at Voices for Gaza on the 3rd of March at the Roundhouse with an incredible bill. Um, please come along to that if you possibly can and you're in London. And now back to the podcast. Uh, so an evil dance between partners. Who are the partners? Right. So this is really important. This is actually one of the key things I want people to take from the series. So here's a snippet now. And it's a kind of the myth of the centre ground. You know, people often refer to themselves as centrists. And that's conflated with being a moderate. This language, you know, suggesting that if, if, if that's the part of the spectrum that you occupy, you're reasonable, you're, ra you're rational, you're sensible. It's nuts, OK? It's, it's a trick. The, what we call the centre ground of political opinion is a social construction. It simply reflects the balance of power. Right now, to be a centrist in this country means to support genocide, at least as with regard to the dominant parties. Um, there was a time, of course, when most people supported slavery and the moderate position wasn't to abolish slavery. It was simply to improve the conditions of the slaves and people saying, hey, we should, maybe, maybe this isn't a great idea. Maybe there's some ethical issues here. They were regarded as extremists. 
And so we cannot use whatever happens to be the dominant spectrum and sort of categorization of our time as a way to adjudicate between what is reasonable and what is um, not. So the dance, the evil dance between partners is an evil dance between the centrists of society who routinely hold power and come into government again and again and fail to help anybody. Essentially, they do the job of ensuring the wealthy and the establishment essentially consolidate their position. They are creating the perfect conditions for the far right to come in and give speeches where for 90% of that speech, they sound very reasonable. Mm -hmm. They critique the banks. In fact, there's a bit in the episode where we have Nigel Farage sounding like a raving left winger, Mm -hmm. talking about, you know, the ordinary people, if they can just come together, we can take on the bankers and the corporations and the CEOs. And then the 10% they add in at the end, yeah, it's full of racist rhetoric, xenophobic rhetoric. It's But there's this relationship between the two. They feed off each other. And to the extent that this dynamic is allowed to play out, the left are excluded. The left are kept out. Um, And I think the media works very hard to sort of say, kind of drill into our heads, that the boundary of acceptability ends at the Labour Party and what The Guardian says. And I think beyond there, it's just radical extreme. And that's been getting further and further right over the years. That's right. the thing. Being centrist 20 years ago is very is very different from being centrist now. It's Being centrist now is far more right. right. You know, they often say about Reagan would be too left-wing now to run as a Democrat. Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's just... Mm-hmm. It, so the idea that there's some steady centre, it's like if everything goes right. And what I loved about what you were um, saying in the doc, Yanis, was about how uh, the... The Macrons of the world need the Le Pens to mm-hmm. say, well, look, if you don't want me, you get Le Pen. And people go, we don't want Le Pen, so we'll vote for you. But that's really, it's too low a bar to clear. That's like saying, well, if you don't have Deborah as Chancellor, you'll have Jeremy Hunt. And it's like, that's too low a bar for anybody to clear. <laughs> like, like to be, it's, it's a real low bar out there. But you're saying in the documentary, they need each other. If they had any sense... On their bedside table, they would keep a picture of one another. Mm. So Le Pen should have a framed picture of Macron next to her and should pray in, for his health every night. And Macron should have a framed picture of Le Pen. Mm-hmm. Because the only reason Macron is president is because Le Pen is the threat. And you know, people vote for Macron. People who loathe Macron vote for Macron to avoid the fascists from getting in. And the only reason why Mac- Le Pen is such a formidable force in French politics is because of Macron's austerity policies that are destroying the livelihoods of the majority who, in desperation, turn to Le Pen. So there is this dance of the two different sides of the same coin. Mm. Um, Think of Biden and Trump. It, It is exactly... But it works. As you said, it's a very low bar. And this logic of the lesser evil is a dynamic which shifts politics towards xenophobia, towards the right. Mm -hmm. Because if the whole spectrum is shifting to xenophobia, towards patriarchy, towards the right, then the logic of the lesser evil will ensure that the person who is a little bit more to the left and center will occupy, as you very correctly put it, the position that the right wing used to have. The question is, why is the whole of the political spectrum shifting to the right? And I will come back to my friends, the bankers. Because, and you saw this as part of this particular episode of the documentary, up until 1971, bankers had very little power. Because we had rules and regulations that banned them from shifting monies freely from one continent to the next, there were very strict rules on them creating money from thin air. Mm-hmm. And that's why banking was extremely boring up until 1971. You know, Goldman Sachs was nothing. I mean, if you were head of Goldman Sachs, nobody cared about you. Today, you are more powerful than the President of the United States. Why? Because after 1971, bankers were released from the shackles of the New Deal and the Bretton Woods system. They, could, they were allowed to do anything, to print money out of thin air. 
And therefore you had a shift of power from the industrial sphere to the financial sphere. So with this shift, social democracy died. Think of Harold Wilson in this country or Willy Brandt in Germany. What was their job, the job of social democrats? It was to sit around one table, the captains of industry, the representatives of the industrial sector of one's country, and the trade unionists. And they would cut a deal between them. They would say effectively to the industrialists, uh, if you want me to protect you from trade union strikes, and, you know, the mob, the riffraff, and so on, we will take a chunk out of your profits, the industrialists' profits. We, half of it we'll give it to the state to fund the NHS, schools, universities, public goods, and the other half we'll give to the workers to improve their, their conditions and their wages. That was social democracy. But once power shifted from the industrialists to the bankers, how do you sit around the same table, trade unionists representing you know, delivery drivers, and Goldman Sachs? Makes no sense to do it. No. So social democracy died. And then you have Tony Blair who comes in. Mm. Or Schroeder, in, Chancellor Schroeder in Germany. Mm. Or people like Sarkozy or Hollande or Macron in <laughs> France. Even if they want to fund the NHS. Remember what Tony Blair did? He said, OK, no longer will I mediate between industrial capital and workers because Thatcher had destroyed the national basis of this country. It didn't exist anymore. She shut it all down and Blair liked it because he was a Thatcherite. Uh, he said, OK, I will cut a deal with the City of London. So the deal will be that I am going to um, release from all the remaining impediments, shackles and constraints, the City of London. If you want to create CDOs and CDO squares, these very toxic derivatives that crashed and burned in the thousand, mm -hmm. eh? go ahead and do it. We're so they deregulate. We're not going to do complete deregulation. Do whatever you want. They just right? said do whatever you want. And in exchange, a few crumbs off your table. I want them for the for the NHS. And he, you know, there were quite a few crumbs off his table, and he did put the money in the NHS while privatizing it at the same time. So a lot of those crumbs would go to his friends in the corporate sector. But nevertheless. It seemed quite social democratic because under Blair, uh, the, you know, the, the welfare state was funded quite well yeah. from the crowns well, of the table of the city. There are doctors who say now 2009 was like a golden age for the NHS. Yeah. Everything worked. Everything and was it was, funded. but the money came from the, from the banking sector. Right. But it came from bubbles that Blair allowed them to build up, which inevitably crashed and burned. And then the. The Labour Party, the Blairite New Labour Party in power with Gordon Brown at the helm, lacked both the analytical power and the moral spine to pick up the phone and say to the bankers, you blew the whole thing up, mm -hmm. you're out. Mm -hmm. I'll save the banks, but you're out. Instead, and one of the reasons why they didn't do that was because their own political campaigns were being financed by these very same bankers. <laughs> so they didn't have what it takes to... Tell them, you are now going home. They kept them there. They refinanced them. And in exchange for that, or along with that, they imposed harsh austerity on the vast majority. So thus, the political system constantly shifts to the right as power migrates from the working class and even from the capitalists, the industrialists, to financiers and now what I call the techno feudal lords who again are not producing anything. They are using the state money produced by the Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, in order to build up these digital fiefdoms of theirs. Mm -hmm. Our job is to create a political force that goes beyond the national borders of the United Kingdom, of Greece, of Germany, because capital is universal, it is global, it is cosmopolitan. Our democratic movements must also be cosmopolitan. You say that in uh, the documentary that actually the fascists don't need to get in. They just need to set the agenda. So if they set the agenda of xenophobia and say it's all their fault, it's all the fault of the immigrants, it's the fault of the refugees, enough that a chunky percentage of the population believe that story, then the parties that... You know, if there's a two-party system, have a chance of getting into power in, in, in any given country, then say, oh, but we hear what they're saying, 
So you don't need to vote for the fascists because we'll, we'll do xenophobia light for you. Yeah. And xenophobia light, you say, has never, ever, ever got rid of xenophobia max. It only encourages and feeds mm -hmm. xenophobia max. It rewards it. Look, I remember you just, you just brought back a very painful memory. It was 1981 and I uh, attended in secret and disguised, I was wearing a hat as well, <laughs> a BNP, a British National Party meeting oh, wow. in Colchester. Wow. 1981. Because I was curious to what the hell are these and people For about? our international <laughs> listeners, that's a far right party. Uh, it's a Nazi party. Fa the fa a fascist, not Nazi. Fascist party. The reincarnation of the fascists of Oswald. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember them discussing a plan to ship migrants and refugee asylum seekers to Africa. Oh my God. And now that's public. And this is the official policy of the Conservative Party. I think that answers your question. Why do they need to be in government, the BNP, or the descendants of the BNP? Well, we saw what happened with UKIP, that, yeah. you know, that Gove and Johnson they said... They took over the Conservative Party. ...said, oh, oh, what, <laughs> well, no, well, you don't need to vote for UKIP. We'll, 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 fight we'll, be UKIP. For you to, we'll fight for you to get Brexit. And they didn't expect to win. They just, they just wanted to show that, oh, we're, no, we've got sympathy with you. And then they accidentally won. And then Brexit and disaster. Um, I don't think they won accidentally. I think the the centre, the radical centre, as uh, Raoul put it, yeah, uh, worked very hard while campaigning for Remain mm -hmm. to ensure that Brexit won. Every time Tony Blair got out there and warned the British people of all the calamities that will befall them if they dare to vote for Brexit, that was a vote for Brexit. Mm -hmm. Every time the German finance minister, with his uh, German accent, as if it was straight out of, you know, 40 Towers, um, uh, warned the British people, if you vote for Brexit, you know, uh, or Barack Obama. Remember, Barack Obama came here and warned the British people. Uh, I remember I was campaigning against Brexit at the time, a radical alternative to both Brexit and the uh, Ramoners. Um, I, I campaigned against Brexit because I thought it would only benefit the xenophobes and the right wing and, and the Johnsons and the Farages, as it turned out in the end. But I remember that uh, you know every time these establishment figures opened their mouth telling people why they should vote against Brexit, I thought, oh my God, we're going to lose. <laughs> I don't see it was accidental at all. They worked really very hard. Remember the Treasury coming out with forecasts that the British GDP would be diminished by 13.4% if there's Brexit. How the hell do you know? I'm an economist. You know, in one of the basic rules of statistics is that you can make no statistical forecast if you have a sample of zero. <laughs> and there had never been an exit from the European Union. So how the hell do you predict how much GDP will go down by? 13.6? Where did that point say? Why not 30.7? You know, it was as if it was telling people this is all made up crap, okay, and it's a propaganda campaign. People don't like that. They get pissed off and they vote for Brexit precisely because they're being lied to in their face. Can I ask you, Raoul, what did you learn while making this documentary that shocked you? <laughs> I think the personal cost of doing what Yanis has done. Maybe that shouldn't shock me. But hearing about the death threats, you know, more than one, multiple to him and, and some family members, hearing about how he's been penalised financially, he had his assets frozen, literally, just money in a bank, one day goes to, to retrieve his money, and it's blocked, it's gone. All, uh, and that, I'm sure that's the tip of the iceberg, but stories like this, some of which are in the series, some, some aren't, and he's told me personally, just really gave me a sense, yeah, this is, this is why people don't say no to those with power in those key moments because on, on you know one path offers you a series of rewards inducements high status positions on the back end and the other is we're going to character assassinate you we saw it with jeremy corbyn in this country right character assassinate you perhaps actually assassinate you depending on which country you're living in um 
and you begin to get a sense of why the world is the way it is and why I think a lot of young people, a lot of young talent, the potential for the future, the future leaders, the future Yanises and Jeremys, I think part of the function of it is to scare them off. Mm. Who wants to go through that? It's, um, so yeah, that, that shocked me. I, I wish the world didn't work that way, but it does. And it, it, it doesn't just work that way in, I don't know, dictatorships on the other side of the world. This is within the EU. Mm. Um, the level of corruption is extreme. It, it just, it just may perhaps a bit more subtle sometimes or, or concealed more effectively. Yeah. What do you think, Yanis, that we can do about it? Um, the most common heckle we get at the Guilty Feminist live shows is, uh, what can we do? What can we do to help or what can we do to change it? What I know our listeners will be thinking is, you know, OK, we mustn't think it's all hopeless because of exactly mm-hmm. what you've said. That, is, mm-hmm. that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're the ones that can change it. If they said, OK, you take over, you take over the UK and you know, you've got four years to change things. What would you do? And given I'm not Chancellor of the Exchequer, probably wisely, let's be honest, uh, what can I do? What can our listeners do? Allow me to answer in, in two ways. Mm-hmm. One will be more philosophical and I'm sure it's not going to satisfy you, but I think it is important to state it that for somebody like me to be running the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom would be a very different place before I even took over 10 Downing Street. Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, It it would have to have a political dynamic that would be very different to the one we have today. Right. But Otherwise, somebody like me would never be leading. But but, but we'll give you the feminist magic wand, which we sometimes have at this show. In this show, we have a feminist magic wand, so we can give it to you. And you, because... Okay, let me be practical. So that, because the the, the worst thing you can do when you're answering such a question is be airy-fairy and um, generalist. Um, I have an article today in The Guardian, which um, I was invited to comment on Rachel Reeves, uh, cancellation of the 28 billion tiny little green investment program and what would have done differently uh, even though I wanted to spend my 1000 words sharing a piece of my mind with them about Rachel Reeves and uh, the Labour Party I didn't, I answered the question so here's an answer and I think that alludes to broader policies that I would introduce um, the first thing I would have done is to create a public investment bank that would have a remit at an arm's length from government, but publicly owned, uh, to issue bonds to the tune of 3%, at least 3% of Britain's GDP, uh, and um, direct the Bank of England to support those bonds in the financial markets. That sounds very technical, but the whole point here is to take a chunk of money from the financial sector and create a large scale 200 billion a year, not 28 billion, investment program in um, the green transition, especially in the energy market, do away with electricity markets. It's pathetic that we have electricity markets because there's no such thing. It's all a figment of your imagination and mine. If you think about it, you know, in your home, there's one electricity cable coming out. You don't have 50 to choose from, so there's no market. It's a government pretending that there is a market when there are all these oligarchs who are essentially stealing from you, Mm -hmm. from every shop, from every home, especially the poor homes. You know, Britain is self-sufficient in energy. That is a remarkable, a remarkable feat. And yet you are, you know, there's a war in Ukraine, the price of natural gas goes up, uh, and suddenly you're paying through through, through your nose for electricity, even though you're self-sufficient. Why? Because those companies sell the electricity elsewhere if it's more lucrative for them to do so. So, you know, there are public financial tools that you can use within this present corrupt system to take 200 billion and create very good quality jobs in a green energy sector which is completely decarbonized and which simultaneously passes on ownership of the grid and generation to communities so that it's communally owned. It's not owned by the state, but it's owned by the communities from neighborhoods in London and in Manchester to uh, energy communities out in the countryside. You know, that would be a demonstration even to Tory voters out there 
that things can be done very, very differently in a way that benefits everyone except the oligarchs and except the bankers. That's the first thing I would do to, you know, as a pilot scheme for really radical change. The second thing I would do is I would get the private sector out of the NHS. Because, you know, you're paying a lot of money for the NHS. And the NHS is be beautifully funded. It has all the money it needs, except that 60% of it goes to private contractors who simply, you know, are parasites and who have entered from within under the Labour government and increasingly under um, Cameron, Osborne and so on and so forth. Uh, these are two small... The third thing I would do, I would start a program of um, uh, sanctioning, divesting uh, from Israel until the apartheid state there ends. Yeah, just to show what a proper, properly ethical um, uh, foreign policy is. Um, and from there on, you take it from one sector to the other. You've got to make sure that you succeed in, in, in carrying public opinion with you, that the radical intervention in one sector worked before you move to the next. Uh, so that sounds like gradualism, but it is radical gradualism. And, you know, if you have another two or three hours, you can <laughs> say, we can say more. You're a very good communicator. I think economics is often very mysterious to most people. It often is to me. And I think, By oh, design. It, right, right. But I, there was a, a, a question time that's actually, there's a clip of it in the, but I don't remember it. I remember seeing it at the time. It, but it's a, it, there's a clip of it in the documentary where a man in the audience says, look, if I've got a tenner and I buy three pints at four quid each, I'm going to be in debt. And economics is like that. Surely this country can just understand mm -hmm. it can only spend what it's got. And you say, but the, that is a great model for you if you earn X and then you spend Y, but it's not a good model for running a country and you explain why in a really simple way that it doesn't work. And then, you, then there's another clip of you at the Oxford Union unpacking that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Could you just as an example, because I think sometimes it's really hard to get your head around it because it's not explained. It's not something we learn at school. Macroeconomics is very difficult to understand. Um, can you explain why austerity doesn't work? Yeah, sure. It's, that's extremely easy to understand as long as somebody, you know, tries to explicate it and not to obfuscate it. Because right. economics is the, the science of obfuscation. Mm. Economists, you know what they do? They take that which everyone can understand and rephrase it in a, in a language that no one can understand because this is how they maximize their monopoly. Mm. The, the economists, I mean. So let's go back to state. Uh, individuals, households, families, small firms, large firms, we as you know, micro units of the economy, persons, families, and so on, we are blessed with an independence between our income and our expenditure. Mm -hmm. So if tonight, you know, then I and I and my wife don't go out to eat and, you know, stay at home and cook some pasta, right? We have saved, what, 50, 80, 90 quid. Our income is not affected. If you're if you're listening anywhere outside West London, you'll be shocked <laughs> by this idea. <laughs> but this is we're we're in West London, and that's yes, we are that's in West real. That's we're in real, Notting Hill. Guys. <laughs> that's why we go home and have pasta because we're in Notting Hill. Not one of us will be eating out tonight. In so you see, place. okay, that's what we do. We yeah. save, we eat pasta and cheese at home. Our income has not been affected by the fact that we saved some money by not going out. Right? That's We've got the, the more money because we say, set home with our pastor and That's right. Dough. Our income is what it would have been. Mm -hmm. And our expenditure is lower. So if there was a deficit, now there isn't a deficit anymore. So belt tightening, parsimony has worked at our level because of the splendid independence of our income from our expenditure. If you're the Chancellor of the... I hope you will become the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Never when you become the yet. Chancellor of the Exchequer... Okay, never going to happen yet. You will not have the privilege of this independence. Right. Austerity. When do governments appeal to austerity and, you know, ad adopt the austerian logic? When the going gets stuff. In other words, the budget of the government is stressed, it's in the red, there's a deficit, and you have Osborne, or now Rachel Reeves, for that mm -hmm. matter, saying that, 
you know, it's in the red, we have to do bell tightening. Well, now, what does this mean? It means that the reason why the finances of the state are not good is because the private sector is not spending enough. Therefore, your, the tax take is not high enough. Mm -hmm. So bad times are times when the private sector is spending less, is depressed. Mm -hmm. So low private expenditure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you try to reduce your deficit as the chancellor by reducing public spending, public expenditure, then suddenly the sum of private expenditure and public expenditure shrinks faster because you have reduced public spending while private spending is coming down anyway. The sum of private and public expenditure, by definition, is national income. So the, the, the country's, the nation's income has shrunk faster because you practice austerity. Your tax take as the chancellor is a function of national income, which means that you resemble a stupid cat chasing its tail until it fades, mm -hmm. or faints, I should say. Right? This is what happened to George Osborne. Uh, those of you who remember amongst the audience, every time he cut public spending, then he had to borrow more. Mm -hmm. Why? Because his tax take was you know, falling. Yeah. That's why austerity doesn't work, can't work. Those who it, it propose hasn't it, ever worked. It has never worked. Has, is in there the any history of the world. example in the history of the world where no. austerity has worked? No, never. It's... Only if you manage to piggyback on others. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example when it did work, but it wasn't austerity that worked. What happened was in Canada in the 1990s, at some point they had a budget deficit, and they cut down. Okay, so austerity shrunk public spending. But at the same time, the United States government, just south of the border, mm -hmm. was boosting its expenditure. Mm -hmm boosting its expenditure, and the bankers were also going crazy with uh, you know, their uh, loans and so on. So the American e economy was expanding. It was attracting more imports from Canada. So private expenditure started increasing in Canada because of that. So the austerity practiced by the Canadian government in the end didn't do much damage. Right. But that's not because the austerity uh, worked. It's because the Americans were not practicing austerity. So it's free riding. If you want to free ride on others, but the idea that if everybody practices austerity, will be better off, that can never ever work. It can't work. work. No. It can't work. But, I, but is it so? Do, do, do politicians do it to to be seen to be tightening no, their belts no, 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 and no, no, say, no. "Oh, we're all in this together"? And you know, is it no, is it because it it no, seems it's far more cynical than that? The Tories never liked the NHS. They never, never accepted. They voted against it when it was first introduced in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, they did, never wanted public education. You know, the rich do not want to pay for the poor. They accepted it, they conceded, you know, the welfare state because they were scared of communism, of the Soviet Union. Once that went away, that threat, they started cutting down and they will never miss the opportunity presented by any crisis to shrink all the payments that they give to the unemployed, to women, to workers, to mothers, to, you know, to children, to students, and so on and so forth. So every crisis is a fantastic opportunity to shrink the amount of money that goes to the working class. Because from their perspective, remember the, these politicians, Osborne, who mm -hmm. was an absolute nothing, a zero, but he was there as the agent of particular capitalist interests who put him there mm -hmm. because he was a zero to do as he's told, right? If you are an industrialist, if you, if you are an entrepreneur, if, entrepreneur, a capitalist employer, your capacity to impose lower wages increases when the welfare state shrinks, when there's no NHS. Because, you know, impecunious working class people will become even more desperate to accept any job offer for any wage offered to them, think of Deliveroo. So if the government gives them a good NHS, good education for their kids, you know, um, some kind of social insur insurance, a safety net, they may be a bit more choosy when it comes to accepting job offers from employers who want to minimize whatever it is that they pay them. So this is, this is, this is what is happening. Which brings me back to my question, what can we do about this? Because it, it feels like we're spiraling very quickly into this 
situation that you describe as in the documentary is very similar circumstances to 1930s Germany, which and we know what happened there. What 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 can we as individuals do? Band together. We can do nothing as individuals. Zero. I mean, you can massage your own uh, conscience by, you know, recycling, by, mm-hmm. you know, do it. It's fine. It doesn't do any harm. It's like a bit of aspirin to the patient. Mm-hmm. But when you've got COP28 being run by the president of an oil company, mm-hmm. whatever recycling you do is not going to change the climate catastrophe that's coming. So, But what can change it is a democratic movement that puts the fear of God or, you know, humanity, into our rulers who start and feel that they are going to lose their position because they really don't want to lose their position. So organize and unionize, basically. The the old story. The old story. You know, as Tony Benn, since Raul mentioned him before, as he said once, and that was a brilliant line, there is no such thing as final victory and there is no such thing as final, final defeat. We have to keep going. And you know what? Let's finish on a, or not finish, but, and this particular part on a, on, 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 a, on, on a positive note. Working together to put the fear of humanity into our rulers is fun. <laughs> <laughs> it really is fun. It's much more fun than working for Goldman Sachs. Seriously. Yeah? Yeah. I, 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 I take that on board, and I think our listeners will too. Um, it is time to wrap up, and uh, what a fun place to leave it. Um, in a rather dispiriting landscape, banding together and sending the, you know, our global leaders a message that we want more and we need more, and we're not going to just sleepwalk slowly to play who's going to be richest at Armageddon, and definitely not us. Um, sounds like a job that banded together could be fun. Um, it's also going to be terrifying. It's also going to be hard work. But uh, there's a per- great purpose and camaraderie to it. Raul, can I just ask you, before we finish up, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? <laughs> About five hours worth, <laughs> if, if you're ready. I'll put it into a book and send it over. Excellent. OK, we'll watch the documentary, because you said an awful lot in that through being a documentarian. Yeah. Um, and Yanis, is there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? One thing, if I may, b- b- besides thanking Raul, because that's his work. I am the talking head, but it is his story, the editing. It, the the, the story is in, in the editing, as you know, with every movie, every documentary. So thank you, Raul. Congratulations. Thank you to the whole team, his family, who did this. It's a great honor. And it's I'm just very humbling. But the one thing I would like to say, um, which uh, it would open a whole wa- a can of worms, but given who you are and given your podcast, I have, as an economist, mm-hmm. to make a statement. Economics is an anti-feminist, male chauvinist way of thinking. The way we teach economics in our universities centers around a model of a person called homo economicus, for Mm -hmm. want of a better term, who is a male patriarchal piece of shit. (laughs) Every economic theory, you mentioned macroeconomics and Mm -hmm. it's hard, is founded on this... this, this Robinson Crusoe-like character called Homo economicus, who is definitely male and whose ethics are presented in a mathematical form, but nevertheless, once you break down the mathematics, all that comes out is this male chauvinist pig underpinning every economic theory and every theory of finance. So it's not a science. It's a kind of patriarchal religion with equations. There. I had to say it to save my soul. I, I genuinely feel that uh, you'll be very popular with the Guilty Feminist listeners. Uh, <laughs> and you, uh, they, no, they, will, they will be fascinated, and I'm sure many of them... You've got lots of books that they can read, which are absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And this documentary uh, is very, very interesting, very accessible. And if you find some of this stuff challenging or you think, oh, is this really for me? Or am I, you know, it, it, it seems so complicated. You've really broken it down in a way that uh, it, you've made it human, you've made it accessible, and you've also blasted through a lot of the bullshit, which, as you say, is deliberate so that we think it's not for us, but actually, you know, no, it is for us. And it's if you're a human being, then you need to care about it, politics as people. Um, so if you have got 1599, we can club together with a few friends to have a viewing party. Um, if you had uh, three mates, they could, you could chip in a fiver each. 
and watch it together. It's called In the Eye of the Storm. It's six parts. So you will you could do it like a book club and uh, get together and watch it every week um, and then chat about it and talk about what you might do together about it. Um, that's how I will recommend Guilty Feminists do it. And if you could write in and tell us how you're going with that um, and we can feed it back uh, to Ra and Yanis and if you come up with any ideas from watching it um, because it will need collective action so you know in a way don't watch it on your own I know the producers are probably <laughs> thinking no do watch it on your own <laughs> pay for it on your own but I'm trying to make it accessible to all of our listeners some people of course will think 15.99 is you know it's it's no big deal and that's just like going to the movies uh, but some of our listeners won't and so for those people I I I say, can you chip in with a few friends or family members and watch it together and, and sit and think and talk about it together? Because I think the togetherness and the collaboration part of it is the most important message I've taken away. So it's called In the Eye of the Storm, but you go to eyeofthestorm.info. But soon it will be on various platforms. Amazon. It will. Amazon, um, Apple, uh, Google Play, Vudu, and... And Google Play and YouTube are the same, you've told me. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, so uh, as the world uh, shrinks towards uh, f four or five billionaires, you, in other words, you can buy it ironically from one of them. Um, <laughs> it's, buy, buy, it, buy it from one of them so that you can stand up to them. This is the terrifying part. But not initially. Initially, yeah. initially, if you buy it now, you, only 10% will go to Vimeo and Vimeo have got to make a living. So that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> that's like an agent fee. That's fine. Uh, so buy it early and um, more of it will go to the people that actually made the documentary. Documentaries are expensive to make because you've got to cart cameras all around and you've got to edit and you've got to do all these things and they, they've done a brilliant job. But it is six episodes for fifteen ninety nine, so it's actually uh, a very good deal. Uh, and um, you, you can buy Yanis's books. You can also buy Raul's got a book. You've got a book too, haven't you? I've got a book, yeah, called Creating Freedom. Thank you. For Creating that. Freedom. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, check out their work, both of their work and... Uh, do write in if you watch the documentary, you've got any thoughts on that, and I'll pass them on. Uh, thank you so much to our audience. Oh, I should say, has anybody got a, like a burning question before we go that I've left out that we should ask? Nope. Okay, they want to go to the pub. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, in that case, uh, can I have a huge round of applause? <laughs> You've been a small but perfectly formed audience here in this studio in West London. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Chris. Uh, Chris, did you get that? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if any of this is recorded, you'll be hearing it now. I've been Deborah Francis White. We've been the Guilty Feminists. Thank you so much Woo! and good night. Thank you, Deborah. Next Chancellor. Yes, yes. I've been the oh, next yeah. Chancellor of the yes. Exchequer. Yeah, yeah. And we've only run over by 10 minutes, which I think is a, is a real achievement. You were fantastic. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. You were really, really good. Just so fascinating to interview you. I can talk to you for hours now. Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.